Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Conegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Great to be here. So today we have Dr. Ben Bickman on the show, who's a biomedical scientist at Brigham Young University, who is known for his research into the roles of insulin and ketones as key drivers of metabolic function. He is the author of the book, Why We Get Sick. This book takes a deep dive into insulin resistance and metabolic health. The book particularly focuses on the role that insulin resistance plays in so many of today's most common diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's. So at the Bickman lab at BYU, Ben and his colleagues investigate the molecular mechanisms that explain the increased risk of disease that accompanies weight, with a particular emphasis on the etiology of insulin resistance and also disrupted mitochondrial function. Before we get to our interview with Ben, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we're especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praised field reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear you review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Low Cardo. The review is titled, Loved It. The review reads, The intermittent fasting interview was fascinating. I'm hooked after listening. Thank you for a smart, intriguing podcast. Well, thank you, Lou Cardo, and we love that name, by the way. And thanks to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Ben Bickman. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Carnegas, and joining us today is Ben Bickman. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Don and Ken. I'm delighted to be a guest. And also joining us is Ken. Hello, Don, and hello, Ben. Hey, brother. So, Ben, I understand that you grew up in a small farm town in southern Alberta, Canada, and that you were one of 13 children. Is that right? That is right. That's a big family. <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah, is. it was. It was an exciting childhood. It was a wonderful childhood, a wonderful place to grow up. Yeah, I can only imagine. And and we'd like to kind of know what were you like as a kid and also what made you stand out from your 12 brothers and sisters? Right. Well, in my memory, I was an angel of a child. Uh, <laughs> but my older brother assures me, one of my many older brothers, the one closest in age to me, he assures me that I was not an angel and that I was a little prick. So I <laughs> probably I was somewhere between the two. But it was a very interesting sort of family dynamic, no doubt. And I credit my upbringing to a great degree for just who I am, for better or for worse. And it's a difficult thing to wonder how I'm unique. I have a bunch of fairly remarkable siblings who are very well accomplished and very educated and just good. I mean, everyone uh, being sort of nice, good members of whatever community they're in from coast to coast. If there was anything unique to me, it might have been a result of where I was in the family. So just a happy set of circumstances where uh, there were a bunch of boys and then my older brothers and then my sister and then then me, then other sisters. And so I, I kind of enjoyed this buffer between my older brothers who were all very aggressive. Of course, athletics and, and, and sports in general was something we all engaged in very readily. But they were all, my older brothers were very aggressive, uh, I, I would say to a fault. And it, it wasn't uncommon for us to be playing basketball when we were all a little older and I was old enough to play, where my older brothers would get into an actual fist fight. And they'd be rolling around on the ground and I'd be the one holding the ball waiting for them to get done. Um, and so it's it's an enviable position to be the youngest boy because they would pick on each other, but they would generally, you know, leave me alone. Also, the timing of it all. So I certainly had these role models of wanting to be athletic and wanting to challenge my body and enjoy the benefits of, of seeing it adapt and get stronger. But I also was young enough to enjoy video games when they came out. Uh, and, and, you know, like when the Nintendo, when the first Nintendo and the Sega game systems came out. Mm -hmm. And that kind of made me a little nerdier. 
than them, but still sort of balanced um, with this one foot in athletics. It rounded me out a little differently. And I think that in hindsight, m might have opened up my mind to the possibility of academia, which makes me the black sheep in the family. Uh, no one else, <laughs> no one else has done this. And I think a part of that might have been a, a seed planted just at the time where, when I was growing up, you know, these little video game systems a a came to be. And I I'm a little embarrassed to admit this. There might have been a little Dungeons and Dragons involved <laughs> in my childhood, also. Um, but nevertheless, I, I guess it was. Being where I was in the family, having a bit of a buffer between my very aggressive, assertive older brothers, and then the timing of it all with just being uh, having things that let you be a little nerdier, um, like video games becoming a little more prominent in particular, might have kind of just balanced me out in a slightly different way. I wouldn't say better because they're all very accomplished, my brothers and sisters, but it certainly it certainly makes me unique. I am the only one in academia, and that might be part of the reason for it. Yeah. And, and on that note, Ben, even though your, your mother died when you were 11 years old, she had a really big influence on you and in that she wanted her boys to be Renaissance men. So can you elaborate on that? And you kind of talked about this a little bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your mother's influence. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, I um, mean, it is, it is really hard, isn't it, to quantify the influence of a, of a loving mother or even a loving father. And I was mm -hmm. very blessed to have a very involved father. All of us were. Yeah. My, my mom, it was, I admire her in my memory because some of the memories I still have of her at this point were her, um, it was her sort of forceful, absolutely insistent, yet never overbearing or, or never extreme efforts to make sure we all practiced piano. <laughs> That's one of the strongest memories I have. But she very want, she very much wanted her, her, all of her children, certainly her daughters as well, but really wanted her boys to be gentlemen and to be accomplished, to be able to, to be musical with instruments and even, even their voice. And she, she wanted a little more than we were willing to give. I remember she wanted me to take tap. Uh, lessons, <laughs> tap dance, and I just adamantly refused, despite my enormous affection for Gene Kelly, in particular, the old actor who was a song and dance man. Anyone who uh, is singing in the rain, for example, that's Gene Kelly. But yeah, so we, we would, you know, appropriately set boundaries where we thought we needed to like, like tap <laughs> dance. But yeah, it was, it was multiple instruments. It was requirement that everyone played piano. And then it was an expectation that we would adopt another instrument when we were able to. And for me, that was the trumpet, which was a bit of a, a springboard to almost every other brass instrument because it's a little known secret that once you've kind of learned to play one well it's not too hard to learn a bunch of others mm -hmm. um but yeah it it was so this combination of a strong encouragement for uh, to read my mom was constantly reading my dad was constantly reading and whereas my dad was always reading kind of murder mystery thrillers my mom was always reading fantasy i tended to go on the fantasy side but but all the family sort of is split like whether they're kind of dad readers or mom readers. And I went on the mom hmm. path, but, but very a big extensive library in our home, always reading, always music in the background. Someone's on the piano or someone's on a violin or someone's on a trumpet. And then always this thread of athletics, a, a very strong focus to have very capable bodies and to learn the satisfaction that comes from accomplishing hard things. Hmm. After graduating from high school, you did a two-year stint as a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints missionary in Samara, Russia. Can you tell us about that experience? That had to be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. This is, I actually really enjoy you guys. Thanks for letting me answer some of these questions. This is a first for me, but it's fun to be able to talk about because we always focus on the scientific side, and I'm always thinking, uh, there's so much more to talk about that's interesting in the world sometimes than science. Yeah, so after I finished high school, I worked for that summer. And then in, in this, in my faith in the church, it's an expectation that young men will serve a two-year mission. And then it is an option for the young women. It's not as much of an obligation, if you will. And I took that very seriously for multiple reasons. I have a very deep faith and I had seen all my older brothers be missionaries. And it was something that I looked at as a sort of a grand adventure. And, and part of the dynamic of this is that all the young man does and young woman will is express a willingness. And there's sort of a, you know, an ecclesiastical sort of process just to make sure you're a good kid. And then after you've gone through that and shown your willingness, then the church will decide where you go. And it had been my dream to, to be a missionary in Russia because of my, my Bickman family background. A Bickman is a Jewish name and my ancestry on that line is, is, is Jewish. 
And it, they were Soviet Jews. Uh, of course, it wasn't a good time to be a Jew in the early 1900s, and so they left. Well, I, I say Soviet, but it was, in fact, before the Soviet Union existed. But they were in, in uh, Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, and it, things were just getting rough. And so the Bikmans who could left, including going to Israel and some where I still have relatives and others going to North America, so my line. But nevertheless, I had seen my, my great-grandpa's writing in his in, in, in paperwork, and that, that was in Russian. And I was so enchanted by that alphabet, by the Cyrillic alphabet. And I'd been learning French very reluctantly because I was in Western Canada, uh, you know, which does not enjoy the sort of Quebec, Quebecois influence in the country. But nevertheless, I'd been learning a foreign language in school, and, and, and I knew I had a knack for it, but I didn't care about French very much. But I was enamored by Russian, and so I had really been hoping and even, may I say, praying that I could be a missionary in Russia. And, and of course, I have no influence over that process, but I, I did consider it almost an answer to prayers that I was able to be a missionary there. And, you know, I won't get into the specifics of, of being a, a missionary for the church, but it was just one of those guys that probably everyone has seen at this point, where you're wearing a white shirt and tie with a little black name tag on your pocket. You know, the people you see riding bikes. I was just in the middle of nowhere, Russia. And S Samara is along the Volga River. It's a beautiful area in Russia that, that no one would ever really know anything about. Because when we think of that western end of Russia, we just think of Moscow and St. Petersburg. But Oh, it was just these beautiful landscapes and very big cities, very Soviet style architecture. So in other words, not particularly pretty architecture, which was a bit of a disappointment because I just love architecture. And in fact, I'd started my undergraduate with the intention of becoming an architect. I just have such an, a deep affection for it, but nevertheless, kind of a brutalistic Soviet style architecture. So the cities themselves weren't overly attractive, but the, that part of the world, those, rolling plains and hills along the Volga is beautiful. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. I loved getting to know just some wonderful people there, just a, a humble, resilient people who had just gone through so much. This was in the mid-90s. And, and these were people who just had learned to roll up their sleeves and get things done, particularly get them done for themselves, despite communism, of course, being an idea where things are kind of given to you. Uh, it, it just doesn't quite work out that way, I would say, in general. It certainly hadn't worked out that way there. But uh, resilient, hearty people who have such a, uh, a warm, welcoming heart. And it was a very funny thing. I learned Russian very quickly and spoke it quite well. And it, it would be such a shock to the average individual when I'd be talking with them. And they could clearly tell I wasn't Russian for multiple reasons. I had a head full of bright red hair and a bunch of freckles, and that's not a Slavic look. And they could tell from my accent. Um, and then when I would tell them that I was American, because I would just say I'm American, uh, be, my mom actually, who had passed away, she'd gotten all of her children U.S. citizenship. She was from Idaho originally. So I was a dual and am a dual citizen. I would just say I'm American when I would meet them, <clears throat> and they would just be – it was too much to, to believe in that middle of nowhere Russia where the internet was nothing, cell phones didn't exist. And they would say, oh, no, no, you're not American. Americans can't learn Russian. It was just too much for them to believe. But nevertheless, it was a wonderful experience. And by the time I'd come home at 21 and then finally started my undergraduate, it certainly helped me be more serious about my studies where, you know, I'd seen so much more of the world and, and, and humans and the challenges and trials that by the time I'd started my undergraduate, I was very sober minded about it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure I was going to do something that would put me in a position to be productive and, and contribute. And, and that helped me navigate what is, I think, in the life of most undergraduates, a very difficult experience because you know you're, you're hopefully getting training in a career that you will likely uh, or hopefully be working in for you know the next 30 years. Hmm. Mm. A lot of them must major in Starbucks then. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. What? In fact, I remember a fellow PhD student, not to get ahead in the timeline here, literally every purchase was seen through the lens of a Starbucks. <laughs> it was it was its own currency. She would say, I could buy two Starbucks for that much. And, and she wasn't being facetious. She was being serious. And, and so to your point, Ken, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty serious area of study. It for is. Some. And one often sees this maturation process you mentioned in people who, you know, they're young, they're you know, just out of high school and they spend four years or six years in the military. And mm -hmm. in one way, they, they receive a late start in life, but in another way, they're really advantaged. You know, they've seen the world, they're more mature typically, 
and more serious. Yes, I, well said. I, I, I think that's accurate. I, when we lived in Singapore for a time, again, not to get too ahead in the story here, Singapore has required military service for young men in particular, and I'm not saying we need to do that here. But I do, in a way, envy that culture where there is this forced maturation that nowadays seems to just, uh, in some instances, never happen. Mm -hmm. Well, you have safe spaces, and I suppose yeah, that yeah. helps. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So talking about kind of the next steps in your career, we, we ask all of our guests on STEM Talk when they first became interested in science. And even though as an undergrad at Brigham Young University, you decided to major in exercise science, you weren't really into science at the time, from what we understand. And I understand it wasn't until you began working on your master's degree at BYU with Dr. Will Winder that you truly became interested in science. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, that was, I'm happy to elaborate on this, partly because th there's some part of me that hopes there are some undergraduates that will listen to this and that some of these sentiments can provide some kind of direction. Because I look back at that time of my life, despite the more expanded global view, and I would even say maturity that I had, it was still very difficult for me to pick a major, something that I'd hoped would be a mechanism to put me on an ideal and long lasting career path. And exercise science was in a way, um, it's one of those, I have to admit this, it is one of those degrees where there is no job that is specifically tailored to it. And so I actually would hope one of my kids wouldn't do exercise science or, or it, unless they have another plan. And, and I ended up developing a next step. But it is the kind of degree where you have to say to yourself, what am I going to do with this? It's unlike nursing or accounting or engineering, where you have an explicit training for a profession and, you know, would to God that all my kids take one of those paths and be immediately employable when they graduate. I had been in that major after realizing I didn't have much of a knack for architecture, to be frank, uh, but, but I, it forced me to step out and say, what do I really, what am I really interested in? And what do I think I could excel in? I was a little naive. You know, I didn't really realize there weren't, you know, a lot of great career options for a degree in that area. But nevertheless, I stepped into that major with gusto. And it was near the very end. I was just entering my senior year and I had just gotten married at the same time. And that helped put an additional pressure on me because I took very seriously the idea that I would someday be a father in my family. And my wife and I, uh, you know, admittedly have traditional views. And, and the idea would be I would be working and she would raise the children. And, you know, of course, that's the ideal for a lot of people. And it doesn't always work out that way. It did for us, but it took much longer than we'd expected. But nevertheless, the idea that I would be a provider helped form my vision of the future. And I was sitting in a class one time and a professor whom I'd come to know fairly well just through friendly interactions. And I was, inv as an, I was an involved student in that course and I'd maybe had two courses from him. I looked at him and thought, this seems to be a wonderful life to be a professor. And, and I, you know, I wasn't thinking about the research side of it. But nevertheless, I thought, I'm going to go talk to him. And, and I did. And that put me on the path to get a, a master's degree here. I just basically stayed in the same department and got a master's degree in exercise physiology. And my view on a master's degree more and more is that it is a degree that simply gives someone time to decide what they want to do. Now, there are exceptions like a master's in business or some of those other professional type degrees or master's degrees. But if it's a general master's degree in science or little, any other field, probably I could say this in, I, I think it's often, and it was for me, I, I'm not too uh, proud to admit it, an opportunity to have a little more time to figure out what I wanted to do. And it was then, uh, Don, as you noted, that I took a class from Will, from Dr. Winder, and he had he was one of the early scientists who'd studied the enzyme AMPK, which of course is a very famous enzyme. And he, he with Graham Hardy out of of Edinburgh, I think, he had really looked at its role in nutrient metabolism. And so I was taking a class from him, and the class was endocrinology, which I just loved. It was my favorite class to this day that, I'd ever, that I've ever taken. But combined with the fact that he was doing active research in a field that I thought was just fascinating, I, I'm embarrassed to admit, I did not know there was still labs, scientists studying nutrient metabolism and its relevance in the human body. I truly thought everything has already been discovered. We know all there is to know. But his influence and getting to know him better absolutely galvanized my resolve. That was when I truly saw this is what I want to do. I want to be a scientist. I want to be a seeker of truth to better understand the natural world. And that then, you know, moved me and started refining my interests to help me identify uh, dissertation PhD work that I want to do. 
So Ben, as you were talking about, you were working with Dr. Winder, and that really became a springboard for you to learn more about nutrient metabolism. And so after you earned your master's degree at BYU, we'd like to know a little bit more about how you ended up at East Carolina University, where you earned a PhD in bioenergetics. Right. That was a result of me paying attention to the papers I was reading. That sounds silly, but it is absolute wonderful. It is the best advice I can give students that are looking at PhD labs. You don't care about the institution. You care about the scientist. And I just found that I continued to see and revolve around studies that had been published by a man named Linus Dome. And it just happened to be that he was at ECU and there was a PhD program that he had had mentored students in, which was the bioenergetics program. I also was attracted to the bioenergetics program in general, although again, my main the main appeal was to work with Linus. But the bioenergetics program was one of very, very few programs in the country with an explicit focus on nutrient metabolism and mitochondrial or bioenergetics or mitochondrial you know, dynamics in the context of nutrient metabolism. So which all, you know, that checked all the interests I had and some I didn't even know I had at the time. And so that that is my advice. And it was my lesson learned. You don't just apply to an institution. You find out who's doing work you like and you contact that PI that, or that scientist. And, and then after contacting the scientist directly and commun- communicating directly, that relationship will naturally evolve for better or for worse. And then, then you apply to the school because you already have an advocate who's going to basically ensure that your application is in because they're going to pay for all your work, your, your, your PhD stipend. So that was my PhD. And that, of course, naturally then evolved into a postdoc later. Hmm. I think that's that, great advice. Too. It is. I was just going to say yeah. that's excellent advice. You must really like to travel because after completing your PhD, you took off for Asia and a three-year postdoc that you mentioned earlier in Singapore at the Duke National University. How did that come about? I mean, how did you find your way to Singapore and what was that like? Right. Yeah, that is a funny story. So we were living in North Carolina and we had just had a baby and our little daughter, our oldest child was about one, about one, um, one year old when I was finishing my PhD and near the end of my PhD, knowing that I wanted a career in academia, that meant I needed to do a postdoctoral fellowship or conduct, you know, postdoctoral fellowship studies. And I had once again been paying attention and seeing a name pop up in in a lot of the research that I was interested in. And that was a man named Scott Summers. And we'd met up at an American Diabetes Association meeting just to sort of, I wanted to meet him and talk with him. He happened to have been working at the time at the University of Utah. And I thought, my wife is from Utah. And so I thought, this will be wonderful. I can do this work that I love, and I can move my little growing family back to Utah, where my wife is from, by her mom and her, you know, her, 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 well, her dad died shortly after, but her parents and her siblings. And so I came out to the University of Utah and interviewed with him. I gave a talk about the research I'd been doing, met the lab. And at the end of the night, which had all gone very well, he's walking me back to the hotel and he tells me, Ben, I'd love for you to join the lab. Let's consider this an official offer. I'll work on the specifics with you. But one thing I want you to know, I've received an offer to move my lab to Duke. And, and, and he said, that's something I'm really considering. And I didn't really even let him finish. I just sort of interrupted and said, oh, oh, oh yeah, Duke's wonderful. That's just, you know, 90 miles from ECU. And I, I, I had been collaborating with some people there and I love the campus, Duke campus and, and the name recognition, the status that would come with it. Um, but I, you know, a little part of me thought, oh, well, you know, if we can't move to Utah, it would be fine. Uh, but then he says, well, actually, this is the wrinkle. It's a uh, Duke lab in Singapore. <laughs> and and I said, what, well, Duke is in Durham. No, no, no. There's a new Duke medical campus in Singapore, he assured me. And so he said, think about it. Look it up. Let me know what you think, and I'll work on an offer. And I am just racing through these this, these options in my mind. I get home to my wife, and I'm just – I'm so – sad to have to tell her that, yeah, I got this offer, but it's it's in Singapore. And I tell her this, and she is just thrilled at the idea. And so we start looking up everything we could find out about Singapore. And in the kind of mid-early 2000s, Singapore wasn't even as known as it is now because of some movies there and the economy that it has there. But it is just this exceptional little island in Southeast Asia, former British colony, so English speaking. But the the government there just really wanted to develop a graduate medical curriculum 
and Duke they considered was the best at that. So they partnered with Duke and they wanted to have an express, an explicit rather research focus in metabolic disorders, partly because of the discrepancy or the disparity that we see across ethnicities where some ethnicities suffer from fat gains, metabolically speaking, much earlier than other ethnicities do. So nevertheless, all of this being said, we ended up taking that dive and it was the most incredible experience. No, no regrets whatsoever to do nothing but pure research in an environment where it was so supportive. And my mentor was very hands off. I had so much freedom to come and go, which was helpful for a young little family. And our second daughter was born when we lit, when we were working there. And it, it, in, in, when I look back at that moment, it really solidified my love of science because it was such a fruitful, open kind of liberal environment in that regard uh, and in, in, a, in a beautiful location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had a, a good deal of collaborations with research groups in Singapore and they've all been excellent. And uh, I particularly like the food there. It's, it's such a mix yes. of food. You know, the Chinese food, the Indian food, it's a wonderful uh, yep, mix, the Malay, Malaysian. The Malaysian food, yep. yeah. So, Ben, you've become known for your work on insulin resistance, and a lot of this has to do with your time at East Carolina when you first started to realize that insulin resistance is tied to many different chronic diseases. So we're kind of curious, do you, re do you remember that aha moment that you had? I do, in fact, very, very well, because it was so pivotal, and I, I'm grateful that I was mindful enough at the moment to remember it with such clarity. Yeah, so my interest in insulin resistance at the time was small in scope, I realize now. I had viewed insulin resistance as simply being the mediator between obesity and type 2 diabetes, that as the body was gaining more and more fat, and I've since learned a lot more of the, the intricacies of this process, but as the body was gaining fat, we knew that type 2 diabetes was also going up almost one for one, the risk of it, and insulin resistance was the great mediator between the two. But I was at a meeting of the American Diabetes Association, and one of my fellow PhD students named Dan Kane, who I still consider a friend, a wonderful man, very, very smart, he had said to me that while we were running, we'd gone running that morning at a meeting, and, and this was in San Diego. So we were out kind of running along one of the paths uh, near the water, and he had said, and he was a much better runner than me, but he had said, hey, Ben, are you going to go to this session about Alzheimer's disease? And I remember saying something like, well, why would I? I study type 2 diabetes. And then him replying, well, that's interesting because the session is titled something like, is Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes? You know, something like that. And that was such a kind of mind-blowing moment to realize that the disorder that I thought was so narrow in scope was not was a little broader. And that, in a way, was the moment where I started wondering how much more relevant this, what I thought was a, a little problem really is. And uh, it's, yeah, it really was that moment. And it's kind of gratifying now because my own lab efforts in part focus on cognition and, and brain energy use. Um, so Ben, much of your research is focused on the role of elevated insulin in regulating obesity and diabetes, as well as the relevance of ketones and mitochondrial function. And I understand that you've been on somewhat of a mission to share this message because as a professor, you realized that you had an opportunity to teach students who were studying to become nurses and doctors how insulin resistance works and also why it's so relevant in terms of chronic disease. Is that correct? It's absolutely correct. Yeah. And and I, I do have a a zeal for this just because the the relevance just continues to grow. A paper had been published by UNC a few years ago, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and they would found in their estimate that 88% of U.S. adults were considered metabolically unfit. And they based this on the aspects of the metabolic syndrome. Now, that's interesting to me because the metabolic syndrome, when it was first identified, was called the insulin resistance syndrome. So another way of interpreting their concern about the low level of metabolic health would be to say they're concerned about the high prevalence of insulin resistance among the U.S. population. And it, of course, goes far beyond the U.S. borders. This is a global problem. And so when I'm looking at these very clever, young, future clinicians, I want a part of them to think when they're looking at their patient, might the problem for which I'm about to prescribe a medication be a result of insulin resistance? If so, then there's going to be a better option than the medication that I'm about to give them. It's not entirely a made-up hope. I know for a fact I've had former students over my 12 years here that have, in fact, adopted that message, and it is a part of their clinical practice. But it's, it's something I took very seriously, and it was the first 
moment where I thought this is a message and here's a, a way to share the message gently. You know, it's not a class about insulin resistance, so I can't be too heavy handed with that. But it, it planted in me this desire to find a way to actually codify the message and, you know, more formally find ways to share the relevance and, and the prevalence of insulin resistance. That's a nice answer. I like it. That's a really good answer. Um, yeah. You eventually started sharing your message beyond the classroom, appearing on podcasts and doing YouTube videos. And you also gave a speech to the student body at BYU. And the speech was titled The Plagues of Prosperity. Great title. And this uh, speech addressed how the human race is essentially eating itself into metabolic disarray. I'm sure that speech must have been very well appreciated. Right. Well, I, I hope it was. I certainly took the invitation seriously. And a lot of this outreach that you were doing led you to write a book, Why We Get Sick. And Gary Tobbs, who's been our guest on episodes 37, 124, and 125, wrote a book called Why We Get Fat. So I understand you reached out to tell Gary you were thinking of writing a book, Why We Get Sick. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so indeed, all of my efforts to want to share this message, it led me to think beyond just the confines of the classroom. And in, in fact, that was absolutely the justification for my first efforts on social media. I had started to rail against the futility of traditional academia, where we are a bunch of clever people finding out really cool things. And the most we do is publish our findings in a peer-reviewed journal behind a paywall that no one will ever read, <laughs> except a handful of other scientists. I had a conviction that the message was more relevant than just that. And, and that led me to get involved in social media and indeed to write the book. But yeah, the title of the book, I, I, I know Gary, and I'd, had, I'd actually had him come out to BYU to give a talk to the college. Mind you, that was not met with unanimous approval. There were people um, who were more dogmatic in their thinking, who were very opposed. And I had to actually deal with some of that opposition later. But yeah, I didn't want the title to be too derivative of Gary's Why We Get Fat. And I wanted to, in a way, have his blessing, in part because I consider him a friend and I respect him very much. And so I just wanted to make sure that he wouldn't think that I was trying to you know, tap into some of his glory, because that really wasn't my intention. The name of the book Originally, when I first had conceived it and even started writing it, was The Plagues of Prosperity, because I'm just so enamored by that title. Ken, thanks for sharing that enthusiasm. I also am enamored with alliteration, so that all played into that. But my, my agent had said, well, Ben, this sounds like it's a book about global economics, which is also something I'm very interested in, but I, I could see her point. And similarly, I couldn't just say, what is insulin resistance and why you should care, because I knew no one would care. You know, that, that's part of the problem. People don't know about the relevance of insulin resistance. And so a bit of a catchier title seemed warranted, and that was the best. But it's a great title. And as your book points out, historically, people got sick because of infectious diseases. So back in 1900, the top causes of death were things like pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis, and gastrointestinal infections that resulted in diarrhea. But today, because of improved sanitation and vaccines and also antivirals, that's really no longer the case. And really today, people are more likely to die from chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes, all of which are related to metabolism. So really, the overarching message message of your book seems to be that many of these diseases are at least partially self-inflicted and at least partially driven by insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. And I suspect that a lot of our listeners have an understanding that insulin resistance plays somewhat of a major role in heart disease and diabetes and even cancer based off of previous discussions. But many people may not be aware that insulin resistance also plays a role in neurological disorders, reproductive health, kidney disease, gastrointestinal disorders, and even reduced muscle mass, bone loss, and even hearing loss. So it's a startling number of health disorders that's related to, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And, and indeed, that this all played into the justification for, for writing a book. I have this naive vision where I could imagine someone who is regularly opening their medicine cabinet and pulling out their medicine for their diabetes, their medicine for their hypertension, and even, let's say, medicine for migraines. And after reading the book, they will realize that, in fact, those three examples, they are admittedly kind of low-hanging fruit because they are so intimately related to insulin resistance. In fact, uh, a result of insulin resistance that they would realize, wait a minute, I'm taking three distinct medications that I thought were to address three distinct and totally unrelated disorders. Well, wouldn't you know it, they are gone, as you said, really 
a result of a disordered metabolism. And to say that another way, they're a result of insulin resistance. And so then maybe the individual would start to alter lifestyle habits in order to address insulin resistance because that is the way to do it. And then realize over time that those three medications have become useless, meaningless, and, and the physician would likely deprescribe all of them. You often point out that many of the hallmarks of aging, which range from skin changes to reduced muscle mass to the loss of bone density, are partially a consequence of insulin resistance. And we all see these in our friends as they age. Of course, not every decline we see as a result of aging is caused by insulin resistance. But you discuss in the book a theory that the world's longest living humans are perhaps also the most insulin sensitive. Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, gladly. Aging has become such an, uh, a point of interest, of course, which I think is just proof of just how decadent things have become that we're all trying to live. We're all trying to become immortal rather than, you know, worry about raising our children well or making sure the nation is stable. But nevertheless, it is absolutely a relevant issue. And we all want to age well. We all want to square off the curve of, of mortality. And rather than having a decades long decline in health, just kind of be fit and capable and then, then, and then off dead. So yeah, there are of course multiple aspects of aging and you noted several of them. And at no point do I ever want anyone to think that I'm claiming insulin resistance is the only cause of chronic disease and even aging. My claim is that insulin resistance is a common cause and it is probably the most relevant of the common causes. You know, each disorder may have some individual ideology or, or, you know, noxious stimuli that are contributing to their development. But insulin resistance is a common one. And I certainly took that charge very seriously in the book to make sure it was very heavily cited so people wouldn't think I was just making it up. But the primary, I mean, if we were to pick the ones you just meant, let, let's pick, uh, you know, bone and, and muscle and, and, and brain in aging. Those for me are the ones I'm most concerned with. I want to make sure that I have very functioning, capable muscles to move around and live an independent life and someday be a very involved grandpa. And I also want to have the cognitive capacity to enjoy the moments as I have them. And so with the muscle, uh, insulin, the evidence, this is debated. I would say the best evidence suggests insulin isn't necessary for muscle protein synthesis per se. There are other stimuli like IGF-1 and growth hormone that have a much greater role, but insulin appears to be relevant with defending muscle protein. And so insulin is inhibiting proteolysis in the muscle. That appears to be how it's anabolic at muscle with regards to muscle protein synthesis, not anabolic with regards to any other nutrients, but with protein specifically, rather than stimulating protein synthesis, it's defending the proteins that have been synthesized at mm. the level of the muscle, at least. And so naturally, as the muscle has become more insulin resistant, muscle cannot defend the muscle protein. And now we have proteolysis or this protein catabolism. And this is, I believe, absolutely why in People with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, we find invariably that they have higher than normal levels of circulating amino acids. Some people have said, well, the high amino acids are causing the insulin resistance. I think that is wrong. I think the insulin resistance is causing the high levels of amino acids because, as I noted, the muscle isn't defended as well and proteolysis is happening more readily as insulin isn't working as well. And then in the case of the brain and cognition, it's a little known fact that the brain is insulin sensitive with regards to glucose uptake. Not all tissues of the body need insulin to pull in glucose. Like a prime example is the liver. The liver doesn't need insulin at all. As glucose levels rise in the blood, the glucose is literally just flowing and rushing into the cells of the liver. However, the liver does need insulin to tell it what to do with the glucose that has just come in, not to mention all the other nutrients that are floating around. So insulin tells the body every cell, what to do with energy. And in some cells, like the brain, but also muscle and fat cells, insulin also facilitates glucose coming in, or insulin has come and knocked on the door of those cells, if you will, and open the door to allow the glucose to come into the cell. And in the case of the brain, that's a very important fuel, where the brain primarily is using glucose and ketones for fuel. And I know this audience is very familiar with ketones, rightly so, justifiable to know about this. It's so important. And it's important in this case too, because in the average individual who's progressing towards metabolic disarray, the body is becoming more and more insulin resistant, the brain as well. And so now a portion of the brain's energy was coming from the glucose that insulin enabled to come into the brain. 
But as the brain has developed insulin resistance, there's less glucose that comes in. And so the brain starts to go hungry. This is a quantifiable phenomenon. And I encourage anyone to look up the work of Stephen Cunane because he's the one who really pioneered these techniques to do this. But you can quantify the amount of glucose that comes into the brain is, and is metabolized, and it is less in people with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. So this is a phenomenon known as brain glucose hypometabolism. And it is relevant to many neurological disorders, not just Alzheimer's disease, but migraines as well, and epilepsy, seizure disorders. So several neurological disorders are a result of the brain basically going hungry because it can't get enough glucose. And this just enhances the relevance of ketones because a ketone coming to the brain is not altered by insulin's ability or efficacy, insulin's, um, you know, the insulin sensitivity state of the cell. Ketones are a fuel that has nothing to do in that case with insulin. But of course, in the whole body level, back to the average individual, they're insulin resistant, which means the brain can't get as much glucose for its energy. And because they're insulin resistant and have higher than normal levels of insulin, insulin is inhibiting the production of ketones from the liver. Insulin inhibits ketogenesis. So there are fewer ketones for the brain to lean on when they need to or when they want to, which is in fact is always, if the brain has any preference for either of them, it's, it's ketones. Because as the ketone levels start to match the glucose levels, the brain is already relying much more heavily on ketone as a fuel than it mm -hmm. is glucose. So if there is a preference, I think it's that, I think it's for the ketones, although I understand it's a tangent. But nevertheless, Ken, back to the question about aging and insulin resistance, I wouldn't claim that insulin resistance is the only variable, but it is a very important variable, and it is one that we can manipulate very readily, unlike other processes over which we would have very little or no right, control. Right, right. And you mentioned Stephen Kunain. Uh, he was on STEM Talk episode 59, and uh, yeah, his research is very interesting. Yeah, I would encourage anyone to go back and listen to that one. He's, it, he's wonderful. Also in TBI and various kinds of trauma-induced yep. uh, brain injury, you see a disordered glucose mechanism as well. That's it's, right. It's interesting. In the book, you make the point there are three primary causes of insulin resistance. Of course, the one that naturally springs to mind is chronically elevated insulin itself. And you also mention as perhaps a second category of causes, stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. And then third is inflammation. Could you touch just quickly on this and uh, mm -hmm. try to tie this together? Right. Yeah. So those are what I consider the three primary causes of insulin resistance. There are other noxious stimuli that can cause insulin resistance, but they, in my view, do so by acting through those primary causes. And when I say primary, I'm using that term deliberately in my own vernacular to refer to causes that have been validated in all biomedical models. So from isolated cells to laboratory rodents or to whole human bodies, if insulin is chronically elevated, it causes insulin resistance, I mean, which is just reflective of a fundamental biological principle. Too much of something will result in a resistance to that something or a decayed signal. And then the stress hormones, as you noted, epinephrine and cortisol, also in all biomedical models that are used by scientists, you can just increase the cortisol, increase the epinephrine in each individually, and the body or the cell will become insulin resistant. And then yes, inflammation. Now, there's a little part of me that mentions inflammation, and I'm kind of wincing at my own mentioning of it, because it is one of those things, not unlike stress, perhaps, which is too often invoked. It's become almost a pop culture almost a meme of sorts where everything is inflammation and inflammation mm -hmm. is everywhere and it causes every problem. And, right. And, and I think people have gone, well, they've become silly with it. And it's hard to um, tell cause from effect with inflammation. That's right. Yeah. And, and even how people define it and understand it. When I say inflammation, I mean the turning on of processes within a cell that you would typically think of as being related to immunity, an immune pathway, you know, a process of various events happening. Whereas People think of inflammation and they think of a big, angry, swollen wound, which can be a result of turning on these pathways. But these immune pathways are found in every cell. You know, the muscle isn't a prototypical immune cell, and yet it has all the same pathways, albeit with different outcomes than, say, a macrophage does. But regardless, when you turn those immune pathways on, like you do if immune proteins are elevated, what, what are called inflammatory cytokines, if these mediators, these markers are moving through the blood, like C-reactive protein, it will activate these immune pathways in the muscle 
which will cause the muscle to become insulin resistant. Now, having elaborated on those three primary causes, I defend, although I don't want to get ahead of myself, the approach to focus on insulin the most because that is something that is so readily altered. It is a lever that if we have these three levers on the wall to improve our insulin resistance, you can grab the insulin lever and start turning it down, pulling it down immediately. But if we were to tell someone to improve their stress or to improve their inflammation, these are such vague processes without clearly defined causes or solutions even. I mean, even if we know they're related to the problem, metabolically speaking, even if we can confirm they're related, and they might not be, it's still another matter entirely to tell someone, well, your stress hormones are really, really elevated. You need to lower them. And then, they, then now they're even more anxious than they were before because they don't know how. Yeah, you just made their stress hormones worse. That's right. Yeah, that's the irony. Whereas with insulin, you tell the person, we need to lower your chronically elevated insulin. And we can do that within the next six hours dramatically. So in writing the book, you said that your goal was to arm people with information on insulin resistance and ways to use this research-based knowledge to both prevent and also reverse disease. You have a section in the book on putting research into action where you provide suggestions that are focused on diet and lifestyle. And the first thing people need to do, you say, is to find out how insulin resistant they are. And unfortunately, that's not so easy to do, and doctors don't routinely measure insulin. So you argue that's because our healthcare system has a glucose-centric view of metabolic health. So we're kind of curious if you could touch on the scientific and history reasons for this. Oh, yes. Yes, I'd be delighted. Yeah, this is, in fact, maybe above anything else, this is my hope for my career, but that at the end of it, paying attention to insulin resistance and measuring it clinically will be more commonplace. If that has happened, regardless of who was the primary stimulus, then I will have considered all of my efforts worthwhile, even if I wasn't the one who directly made it happen. But yeah, we have we do have a glucose-centric paradigm to looking at metabolic health. We measure lipids. So the average blood test annually, someone goes in for an annual visit and We never all go in annually, right? It's always several years between the visits. But we get a lipid panel thinking that's relevant to heart disease. And then we measure glucose. And that's kind of the measurement of metabolic health. We we go no further because we say this is what's moving. This is the marker that shows us where you are in your progression towards type 2 diabetes. And unfortunately, that has put us in the wrong place because by looking at glucose, we miss the mark until it's much later than it could otherwise be, and we treat the disease more poorly than we would otherwise. And briefly, what I mean by that is, by the time glucose actually starts to increase consistently year over year or whatever for an individual, they've already been waging a war of insulin resistance. And that's because insulin resistance is a state of elevated insulin, but the insulin is working well enough primarily at the muscle to help the glucose levels stay in a normal range. And so it's flying under this clinical radar. But again, if we were to have shifted the focus away from the glucose and, and measured the insulin, we would we would detect that the insulin levels were much higher than would be ideal and certainly have been increasing year over year. That would have been the more sensitive marker. And indeed, changes in insulin can occur decades before glucose starts to chronically change. So all the more reason to shift the focus mm-hmm. because we detect the problem so much sooner. But then having detected the problem sooner or even later, if our focus is insulin, then we improve the disease so much better. For example, the average type 2 diabetic, you know, by the time the glucose levels have risen to a point of being clinically relevant, now we act and we just want to push down the glucose as quickly as we can. And there are a lot of incentives for the physician to do this. That is one of the main clinical markers, for example, that a physician will be evaluated on with regards to Medicare. If they see Medicare patients, one of the variables that they're responsible for is lowering the glucose and the hemoglobin A1C levels. And so they have this strong incentive to lower the glucose. And yet, once again, insulin levels are elevated. So at that point, they have high insulin and high glucose. And the average clinician, out of ignorance, or something more malicious, but also just say ignorance and, and these incentives in the, in the profession, they will just say, well, we just need to lower the glucose. So who cares if we push the insulin up even higher? So here's a prescription for insulin, or here's a medication that will force the beta cells to make even more insulin. I say even more because insulin levels are elevated in type 2 diabetes. There is no exception to this. If it's type 2 diabetes, it is high insulin and high glucose. The insulin just isn't working very well. And wouldn't you know it, 
The more aggressively we try to lower glucose by increasing insulin, the more the patient dies. They're three times more likely to die from heart disease, twice as likely to die from cancer, and twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. So putting a type 2 diabetic on insulin is like trying to treat alcoholism with another glass of wine. You're giving the person more of the very thing that has caused the problem. And indeed, in this clinical instance, they become more and more resistant to the insulin, and thus the insulin dose just continues to climb until it is so ineffective that other medications, at that point, it's already polypharma, but it's just continuing to add to the list of medications, all in an effort to lower the glucose when the true problem would have been solved by addressing lifestyle variables to lower the insulin. Mm -hmm. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, performance, and resilience. Because of the historic focus on glucose that you just described, except in really uh, forward-leaning physicians and some small physician groups, there doesn't seem to be a strong consensus on what an optimal insulin level is. You know, they, they have ranges if you go to Quest Labs or LabCorp, and those ranges are based on everybody who walked through the door. Mm-hmm. And we've just said 88% of them are, have a metabolic derangement of some kind. So we don't really know what optimal is. Do you have thoughts on what you see as optimal in terms of insulin? Oh, yeah, I I sure do. In fact, you framed this very well because the range of insulin is problematic. If someone even gets insulin measured at all, they will see that uh, an acceptable range could be anywhere from 5 to 20 microunits per mil. And I would look at that range and say at the high end of that, that's about three times higher than it should be. But the problem, before I answer the question, is, as you stated, this is based on averages. And the average person, as you noted, has some form of insulin resistance, which again is defined as elevated insulin, but normal glucose. And it's it's because people so classically think of insulin as just being intimately coupled to glucose levels, that that has given them this normal range. Because then they will say, if insulin is 30 microunits per mil, well, that's associated with higher glucose levels. But the truth of it, again, is that insulin can be elevated and still several times higher than it should be, and yet glucose hasn't moved much. So I have a very strict definition, which I can defend and do so in the book with citations, but I also have a little wiggle room. So if someone has a fasting insulin level that is six microunits per mil or less, that's a very good sign that they're insulin sensitive. However, because insulin, like all hormones, has a circadian rhythm, it's possible that someone could go and get a test and it were 8 or 9 or 10. And I would say then, because we can't know whether we just happen to have measured insulin at the peak and we don't want to go back four hours later to try to do it again to get another blood test to see if we can catch it at the, at the low point. But if someone has a fasting insulin of 10 or lower, that's probably a good sign. It's evidence probably that they're insulin sensitive, but then it justifies looking at additional markers that are not subject to the natural ebb and flow of hormones like lipids. Measuring, for example, the triglyceride to HDL ratio, and that if it's less than around 1.5, that's a very good sign. Or measuring the triglyceride glucose ratio, and if it's, you know, if it's in an acceptable range, then that's another good sign. So if, if insulin is, is fasting insulin is low, that's really, really great proof that the person's insulin sensitive. But if it happens to be a little higher than, than I would say is optimal, then all the more reason to not let one single variable, even if it is insulin, be the single marker of the problem because it does manifest in multiple ways, including affecting blood lipids. And so blood lipids can become an additional marker of the condition. Yes, this is one of my pet peeves, the reliance on normality. Normal is not a goal. Homer Simpson is normal. <laughs> uh, if you want to be normal, go to the mall, look around, go to, or go to the airport, look around. That's normal. And that's the folks that are driving the statistics in the lab test. You know, so, yes, you know, well I, said. It's, it's very frustrating when 
I have friends that go to the physician and it's not just insulin, it's everything. It's testosterone, it's everything. And this guy's falling apart and they tell him he's normal. Well, yeah, because that's what happens to people. But it's, yeah, it's the it's, normal state. Yeah, it's man, not a it's good the normal state. state is falling apart prematurely. Yeah. It, it is. In fact, people are sometimes that are very ketogenic are sometimes told that uh, they, you know, they flag them on the insulin on the test because the insulin is lower than the range on the test. Have you seen that? Yes. In fact, I there's a little part of me, um, Ken, that is thrilled you brought that up because it gives me an opportunity to briefly go on a, a quick tangent. Yeah. So people will have on a ketogenic diet, they'll go in and their fasting insulin will be three or something. 1.9. Yeah, you're right. I, That's right. Even I lower. just did it. 1.9. Yeah. Yep. And then the physician will say, oh, gosh, you have uh, a latent type one diabetes. <laughs> exactly. <developing." laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the reality is you're just so sensitive to insulin that the body just needs that little of it to get the job done. But this is a perfect example to emphasize what I consider to be a mistake that has entered into the ketogenic community, not necessarily the scientific realm, but in the kind of lay person community realm where people will say that a ketogenic diet causes a physiological insulin resistance. That is just uh, it, it is inaccurate, and, and and thus I would say it's wrong. People will say that. They will say that a ketogenic state causes a physiological insulin resistance, thinking they're being kind of clever. But the, the truth of it is, if someone is adhering strictly to a ketogenic diet, well, first of all, there is no such thing of in, as insulin resistance without elevated insulin. You cannot have that series of events. If there is insulin resistance, insulin is elevated in every known identified state without exception, whether it is the pathological insulin resistance that my lab focuses on more related to diseases, or whether it's physiological insulin resistance that comes with pregnancy and puberty. Even though that has its unique set of causes, it still is invariably associated with elevated insulin. So the fact that the insulin is one point something should be proof positive this is not insulin resistance. Nevertheless, there is this troubling trend, which is if someone is in a ketogenic state and they were forced to drink a solution of pure glucose, it takes like an oral glucose tolerance test, it will take them longer to metabolize that glucose, giving potentially a false positive. Or in other words, the physician would say, boy, you failed that test. It must be because you have insulin resistance, which is not true. We've done tests in animals on ketogenic states called an an insulin tolerance test, if you give the animal a bolus of insulin, their glucose drops so immediately that very often you have to intervene and give them an injection of glucose to keep them from going unconscious. They are so sensitive to the insulin. But what happens in the whole body physiological state of a ketogenic diet is that the beta cells have become accustomed to producing so little insulin that they do not have insulin on hand, if you will, what's called a first phase of insulin secretion. When someone goes and engages in a glucose tolerance test, there will be two phases to insulin secretion, a first phase and then immediately a big longer second phase. The first phase of insulin is accounted for by all of the insulin insulin that the beta cells have already preformed on hand, ready to go. And then the second phase of insulin secretion is when the beta cells are making it from scratch as they've turned on all the metabolic machinery to make new insulin to fine tune to bring the glucose levels back to a normal range. But the beta cells are so efficient that even after about 16 hours of a pure fast, so this isn't just relevant to a ketogenic diet, even fasting. So someone would unwittingly be working against themselves if they fasted for too long, you know, 16 or so hours before going to take an oral glucose tolerance test. Even in that short time frame, the beta cells get rid of all their extra insulin because they look at the insulin cluttering up the space, if you will, and just start to break it down. And thus, when the body and the beta cells in particular are challenged with this massive glucose load in the form of a glucose drink, they cannot adequately control the glucose response because they just didn't have all that insulin on hand. They didn't know they would need it. And then nevertheless, they can still make it, and thus the glucose levels will get back to normal, but it took longer than it should have. Again, leading the clinician to perhaps result uh, to conclude in a false positive test, thinking there's a problem when there isn't. Right. And so it behooves the person 
to not fast too long if they're going to take an oral glucose tolerance test or the ketogenic diet adherent to take a little glucose, you know, several hours before they go in just to remind the beta cells what they need to do and to start keeping a little more insulin on hand. And then they'll go past the test with flying colors. Anyway, I understand that was a big tangent, but just relevant to some of the confusion that surrounds a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see uh, same thing with IGF-1 levels for similar reasons. When people are deep in ketosis for a while, their IGF-1 level drops significantly and causes all kinds of confusion and consternation. Yep. It is a unique metabolic state and many people don't um, account for all the context and, and conditions. So after getting their insulin levels tested, you advise people to start using their muscles, which you describe as a, a critical component in the fight against insulin resistance. So how, how does that work? Yeah, so it's, I don't ever want people to think that exercise is the solution. I think it's more diet, but there's no question it helps. By mass, muscle is the main consumer of glucose by a wide margin. Um, and, and that is for a couple of reasons. One is that muscle does have a generally higher metabolic rate than average tissues, although many other tissues are fantastically higher than the muscle. But the muscle is dynamic in that it can go from a modest metabolic rate to a 20 times higher metabolic rate as it starts exercising. But just because there's so much m muscle mass, it just is the greatest glucose sink. When I say sink, I mean that as a term of physics and you guys would understand it, but sometimes people think, well, then where's the drain? You know, I don't mean that kind of sink. I mean like a heat sink of sorts where it's just this big absorber of all the glucose. And so when someone starts to move the muscles and dynamically contract and relax them, they're able to open those glucose channels, those glucose transporters, without the need of insulin. Even though there's insulin there, now the muscle can basically tell insulin, hey, I my metabolic demand is so high that I don't need you to tell me what to do. I got this. I know how to do it. So there is, in fact, an insulin-independent activation of pulling in the glucose, and thus glucose levels can get corrected very quickly after exercise, not during usually. In fact, it's not uncommon to see glucose levels go up during exercise, but after, give it a few hours later and it will start to settle down. And a point that you frequently make is that the food we eat is either the culprit or the cure, and it's either making us sick or it's making us better. So you advise people to control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, and this is a quote here, fill with fat. So in terms of carbohydrates, you point out that it's extremely desirable for most of our cells and organs to be insulin sensitive. And it is this insulin sensitivity and the absence of chronic hyperinsulinemia that leads to all the wonderful benefits in metabolic health that people see with carbohydrate reduction. So can you touch on these benefits that are associated with low carbohydrate diets? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you really, you pitched it well. And I hope everyone can further appreciate my affection for alliteration. I tried to work <laughs> that even into my dietary recommendations. I start with the control carbohydrates first, because I, I think it's the most important. And there are many ways I could go about answering this question, including invoking fat cells. And uh, but, but I don't really want to. I would rather just say that when we start to control carbohydrates, all things equal, we have removed the biggest offender which is that if, if chronically elevated insulin is the main driver of an individual's insulin resistance, and I believe it is in almost every case, there could be exceptions like with autoimmunities or diseases of chronically elevated cortisol, but for the average individual, the pedestrian form of insulin resistance, the chronically elevated insulin is going to be the culprit. And then the logical target, once we've identified that culprit, is dietary carbohydrate, where it is absolutely the macronutrient that will elicit the greatest insulin response. Um, although there is such a variety of carbohydrates that some will have essentially none, like broccoli, and others, like wheat, will have a significant insulin release. And so I don't mean to say all carbohydrates are bad and they should all be avoided. I never want that to be how people interpret that comment. But control carbohydrates means basically do not get your carbohydrates from bags and boxes with barcodes. You want them to be natural sources like fruits and vegetables eaten, not drinking or drank. You know, eat them, don't drink them. Where we want that those, those, whatever starches are in the fruits and vegetables, we want them to come with the fiber that they were intended to come with. And if, if that is how someone is, def is controlling their carbohydrates, then they have absolutely taken the most important step. And then the other two steps, prioritize protein. And then now I've altered the last one to say, don't fear fat. Um, those are intended to just be an encouragement to let those macronutrients be consumed liberally. 
and eat as much of these two as, of these macronutrients as you want because the insulin effect is either very modest in the case of protein or non-existent in the case of dietary fat. And, and thus, once again, you're helping control insulin. You're helping insulin stay at a basal or fasted state even when you're not fasting. You often encourage people to consider intermittent fasting and uh, research, including that in your lab at BYU, has shown that this allows the body to burn more fat, increasing a person's metabolic rate, as well as activating autophagy. So can you touch on the significance of autophagy? We've covered this in the past in STEM Talk, but a quick reminder for the listener about autophagy, and then we'll discuss this more. Yeah, yeah. So I define autophagy as, well, mind you, I teach a lot of undergraduates, so sometimes my definitions are a little simple, but hopefully always clear, as basically a process whereby the cell renews itself. It's not a new cell, but for all intents and purposes, it's become kind of new. It's basically a cell's way of keeping itself young and, and functioning. And thus, autophagy could be ideally leveraged as a tool to help the body stay healthy. Now, insulin once again, is pivotal to autophagy. Autophagy is a process that consumes energy. It costs energy to break things down and build new things up, new organelles or new parts of the cell. Well, insulin abhors wasting energy. Insulin only wants to save energy. And thus, it's no surprise that insulin considers autophagy antithetical to its purposes and insulin inhibits autophagy. This is partly why some of the legendary fasting starvation scientists like George Cahill, they would note that insulin is the hormone of the fed state. And it's the absence of insulin that defines the fasted state. This is a, a sentiment that I've really taken to heart. These lessons of our academic predecessors or ancestors, it's absolutely accurate. Now, perhaps someone would say it's overly simplistic. But even in this very unlikely scenario of low calorie but high insulin, insulin would still be inhibiting autophagy. Because even though we say that fasting will activate autophagy, that's absolutely true. I would say it's not because of the low calorie, it's because of the low insulin. Because if a cell is exposed to insulin, even in a, a low energy state, autophagy will still be inhibited. Now, that leads me to look at fasting and define it in two different ways. One is a true caloric fast, which would be reflected in intermittent fasting, which I think can be a very effective tool for improving insulin sensitivity, where you are not eating or drinking any calories. But as I noted, I think ideally this is coupled to what I call, for lack of a better term, a nutrient fast, where the person is eating, calories are coming in, but it just happens to be the calories from nutrients that have little or no effect on insulin, namely protein and fat. And nature always has the two of those coming together. A lot of the problem that people have with protein, I think, comes from the fact that they've removed the fat that was intended to come with it. But nevertheless, I'm an advocate of intermittent fasting. I enjoy seeing the enthusiasm with which intermittent fasting has grown, and I'm good friends with Jason Fung, and, and he's, of course, the, kind of the godfather of the modern fasting movement. Appropriately, he's a good spokesperson for it. I only get a little uh, wary when I worry that people have mistaken some priorities here. And by that, I mean how a person ends a fast is more important than how long they fast. For sure. And that's often what does the damage is how they end the fast. That's right. You mentioned Jason Fung, and he's also a, a person that will be on STEM Talk. And Mark Matson is on the academic end, an excellent person to learn about intermittent fasting from, both in his book, but also on several episodes of STEM Talk. Mm -hmm. We're talking about autophagy and the Matt Caberling episode of STEM Talk. A lot of the discussion revolves around rapamycin, which is a powerful inducer of autophagy. So that episode may be of interest to folks particularly interested in autophagy. One of the side things I wanted to mention was a lot of the research about autophagy and fasting is in rodents. And autophagy is activated much quicker and to a much greater degree in rodents than in humans. And this has caused some confusion in the literature and sort of begs the question, does autophagy occur to a meaningful degree in response to intermittent fasting as is typically done in humans? And if so, do we really know in humans how long the fast would be to incur the inducement of autophagy? <laughs> 
Oh, what a wonderful question. Uh, a lot of no answers to these questions, but I'm thrilled that you're bringing it up. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I am reluctant to speak about it with too much authority, perhaps partly because I'm not an autophagy scientist, but also there is no way to quantify this in, exactly. in, in a person. You can't go to your doctor and say, can you please measure my autophagy? There's no clinical test for this. And, and, and you're right to point out the problem with extrapolating beyond rodent studies. The more I've worked with rodents, the more I get worried about some of our conclusions. And indeed, this is part of my reason for starting to do human work now as much as I can without being coupled to a medical school. For example, with ketogenesis, basically every mouse is in ketosis at any moment is, is what I've concluded. And even when you put the mouse, if you have two groups, two populations of mice, one's on a standard high carb kind of chow mouse, ch rodent chow diet, and the other one is on a 1% carbohydrate ketogenic diet with lard, their ketone levels are still going to be practically identical. Rodents just inherently get into this little ketogenic state. Their insulin is exceptionally low, mm -hmm. and you've got to throw everything in the kitchen sink at these guys to make them insulin resistant and and start to gain weight. They're just, it is very difficult to do. So a lot of the autophagy research, I could see it being problematic yeah. only because I, I know from experience that it is very difficult to get any delta or any difference in ketone levels between uh, any diets on animals. In fact, the, the work that we are literally just submitting this week where we've looked at the bioenergetics in the hippocampus in rodents on standard chow fed versus ketogenic diet fed, uh, ketogenic diet, we had to give the animals a, a ketone ester in their ketogenic diet to try to push the ketones further apart from each other in order to believe or be confident that what we were seeing was a ketone related phenomenon. But you put a human on a 1% ketogenic diet compared to a diet that's 60% carbs, then the, the difference in ketones is going to be 10 times you know, but you just don't see that in the rodents. You've really got to apply some nutrient leverage and pressure in order to push the two apart. Absolutely. It's a, it's an increasing problem, I think, uh, because the press releases don't mention rodents usually. The media doesn't usually mention rodent. And when they do mention rodent, there's not an in-depth explanation, like in the case of autophagy, that this is really very, very different in rodents. Yeah, yeah. Well said. That's right. Whether it's through a ketogenic diet or through intermittent fasting, which is, of course, a ketogenic diet of sorts if the fasting period is long enough to induce ketosis, there are many ways to go about controlling carbohydrates. The most important thing that people can do, however, is the thing you say everyone should do is avoid the standard American diet. I hate that term. Uh, there's really no mm -hmm, such mm -hmm. thing. It's like the Mediterranean diet. What is that, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but, but everyone knows what you mean when you say standard American diet, which is high in carbohydrates and as a result, as you've been very nicely explaining, greatly elevates insulin levels. It's a primary cause in many ways of our nation's obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemics. Can you touch a little on how the diet that we typically see in the United States drives fat storage in the body and slows the person's metabolic rate? I know you've touched on it a little already, but maybe we could just hit that one more time. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. In fact, I can, we, we can go um, deeper here, and I'm delighted because it plays off my own research published from my own lab. In fact, Ken, though, before I say that, I... I echo your sentiment that the standard American diet is really just the global diet. You know, having been around the world and giving talks, um, having given talks about metabolic health through the Middle East and, and Asia oh. and Southeast Asia, it is, this is everywhere. This is not an it American is. diet. It is global. If you spend and, time in Dubai in those yep. giant malls, you know, those, yep. those mega malls, oh my goodness. That's right. In fact, indeed, the most diabetic countries on the planet are in the Middle East. Unless statistics have changed in the past couple of years, countries one through nine are all in the Middle East. The United States isn't even in the top 10. We come later. So this is not the standard American diet. It is a global diet, and some places do it even worse than we do. And by worse, I would mean that they eat a lot of refined starches and sugars and coupled with a hypercaloric environment. So this is this is a perfect storm where we have Excess energy, not that I need to invoke energy necessarily, but also elevated insulin because insulin tells the body what to do with energy. It's something I've already stated, but it is so important and it touches on a deeper discussion that we're not going to get into, which is what are the origins of obesity? You cannot, we, we, we split hairs. We say, well, there's the caloric camp. Well, no, there's the insulin camp. 
And I say you cannot have one without the other. There's no, uh, there's, uh, I mean, you, you actually can. You can have hypercaloric with low insulin, um, which is an advantage. Well, that's a ketogenic diet, potentially. But if it's elevated insulin and hypercaloric, then why are we trying to split hairs here? But nevertheless, insulin tells the body what to do with energy, not only by way of signaling biochemically what to do with the fats and the glucose and the proteins and the ketones and the lactate, all these potentially caloric energy sources. I mean, insulin will tell a cell what to do with these things, but it also does explicitly alter the rate at which the cell is working. Insulin is so determined to store energy, particularly in fat cells, that my lab has confirmed, and others had previously touched on this. We just approached it a bit more in depth at the level of the mitochondria. Insulin will slow the mitochondria in fat cells. You know, fat cells have a metabolic rate. Interestingly, fat cells from females have a metabolic rate that's about 50% higher than fat cells in males. But nevertheless, insulin will slow that metabolic rate by making the mitochondria more efficient. So mitochondria have an inherent sort of efficiency spectrum, which is that they only are burning enough fuel to couple the amount of energy that the cell needs. So this is a very coupled process where the cell will say to the mitochondria, I need this much energy. And the mitochondria will then say, okay, well, I'm going to burn this much nutrient fuel to give you that much energy. And, and so normally the mitochondria are very coupled and, or efficient. And they certainly are in, in most fat cells, very low energy rate, very low nutrient use. However, when insulin's high, it, it couples that even more. It slows the metabolic rate even more. In contrast, when insulin is low and now ketones are higher in the body, you increase the metabolic rate even in human fat cells. And we did this through testing fat biopsies in humans. The metabolic rate will increase two to three times at the level of the fat cell. And I believe this contributes to the higher metabolic rate that you see at the whole body level, whether it is Kevin Hall's work showing that the metabolic rate is about 100 calories per day higher in a ketogenic state, or whether it's David Ludwig's work showing that the metabolic rate can swing almost up to 300 calories per day. And these were using two different techniques, two very different labs, and yet the evidence is consistent with that found over 100 years ago, that when insulin is low and ketones are high, the metabolic rate in the entire body is much higher than it should be. And again, part of my lab's contribution is finding that this is happening, at least in part, at the level of the fat cell. Yes, uh, the ketone esters also induce a strong uncoupling. And uh, that's right. In adipose tissue, they've looked at it in brown adipose tissue. Yeah, in fact, that's right. You mentioned the uncoupling because I, I didn't mention that, but you're apt in doing so, that's a good way to describe it. Because whereas the mitochondria, when they're very efficient, are very coupled, like I'd said, only burning as much fuel as it needs to produce the energy that the cell demands. When the mitochondria become uncoupled, which they are in fat cells, when fat cells see higher levels of ketones, now the mitochondria are just burning through fuel, not to create a chemical energy, but just to release it as heat, right. which is, of course, the ultimate kind of waste form of energy. So Ben, recent discoveries have revealed that ketones are not only viable fuel sources for all cells of mitochondria, which um, include the brain, but also legitimate signaling molecules that elicit advantageous changes in inflammation, cognition, oxidative stress, and much more. And in addition, ketones may also be relevant metabolic fuel in the context of physical activity and ath athletic performance. So our listeners may be interested in a 2019 interview that we did with John Newman at the Buck Institute, which was episode 94. And that was focused on the ketone body beta hydroxybutyrate, as well as our interview with Brianna Stubbs, which is episode 54 on ketones and athletic performance. So in a 2018 paper you published, Ben, you reported on the results of a study that set out to shed light on the specific effects of the ketone body beta-hydroxybutyrate on muscle cell mitochondrial physiology. So can you walk us through this study? Um, and just to note, the study appeared in a special issue of the International Journal of Molecular Science on the effects of ketones on metabolic function. Right. That is a wonderful follow-up because I had just in describing the effects of ketones at the fat cell, 
I mentioned that it creates an inherent inefficiency, which if you're just trying to shrink the fat cell is an absolute advantage because now the fat cell is just burning its own energy and it starts to shrink as a result. Now, however, if we applied that same logic to the muscle cell, what was an advantage in the fat cell becomes a distinct disadvantage because if you are trying to get a lot of work or power out of your muscle, if the muscle is inefficient in how it uses energy, well, now it is catastrophic to performance. And what we found, interestingly, is that in stark contrast to how the ketones influence mitochondrial uncoupling or causing mitochondrial uncoupling in the fat cell, there was no evidence of mitochondrial uncoupling in the muscle cell, that the mitochondria maintained a perfectly normal coupled state in the presence of the ketone. So there was no evidence of this inefficiency. And again, I consider this to be quite a unique metabolic advantage where you don't want the muscles to be inefficient. I, you know, I hope I've made that clear. You want the muscle to just be wringing every ounce of productivity it can out of every nutrient that it's burning. But beyond that, we found that when the muscle was provided ketones, it created less oxidative stress per unit oxygen consumed. And that's a reality of metabolism, mitochondrial metabolism in particular. When you're burning things, you just get a little bit of exhaust. There is no avoiding this. It is a fundamental feature of bioenergetics. When you're burning a fuel, you get a little oxidative stress created because burning does involve the reason we say burning at all is because oxygen is so relevant to these processes. And, but it's not surprising that you burn it and you get a little bit of stuff you don't want, like some oxidative stress. Now I'm even being a little silly in describing that. The fact is oxidative stress itself is a signaling event that is beneficial and that if we try to squelch the oxidative stress too much, bad things happen. But nevertheless, we found that as opposed to just glucose, when the muscle was provided beta-hydroxybutyrate, the amount of oxidative stress produced per unit oxygen that the mitochondria are consuming was significantly less. In addition to that, we found that the muscles were, for lack of a better word, more the muscle cells were more resilient, that they were able to withstand a noxious stimulus and maintain a functioning state. Uh, and this certainly, I think, gives us an additional incentive to appreciate the role of ketones in the context of exercise. Now, despite my initial academic pedigree, I don't study exercise as a model anymore. I'm much more interested in fat cells than I am muscle cells, ironically. But nevertheless, our biochemical mechanistic evidence certainly lends some support to the more kind of global whole body effect of an advantage to exercise performance with a ketone available as an additional fuel. Mm. Following up on muscle, when you look at the role of ketones in a ketogenic diet, in the maintenance of muscle, in the avoidance of sarcopenia, it seems to have a strong effect, not so much an anabolic effect, though there might be a small one, but a very strong anti-catabolic effect, as described in the paper by Egan and Kutnick. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's really interesting when you look at muscle mass as sort of the trade-off between the catabolic forces and the anabolic forces. It's interesting to see the effect is really uh, with ketones largely on the anti-catabolic side of the seesaw. Yes. Yeah. That's, I loved their observation that you noted. It is also, it, it continues to add credence to the maxim that ketones are muscle sparing. Once yes. upon a time, that maxim was invoked because if the body has enough fat to make ketones to fuel the brain, then the body does not need to start breaking down muscle to convert those amino acids to glucose that would then feed the brain. In other words, ketones give the brain a break from glucose, which in turn spares muscle protein, which would alternatively be converted to glucose to fuel the brain. So that was the classic reason for saying ketones are muscle sparing. Again, Basically, if you have enough fat to burn and you're turning into right. ketones, then you can spare the muscle. But now we've gone beyond that, as noted my study and the Kutnick study, noting that there is, in fact, beyond this kind of general global energetic demand and supply, that there is a direct signaling effect, back to Don's original question, whereby the ketones are beta-hydroxybutyrate in particular, likely, perhaps through some kind of G-protein coupled receptor, which they're known to activate, or some other receptor that we don't know yet are directly inhibiting the catabolic proteolysis of skeletal muscle. Another factor uh, that influences exactly what you're talking about is it's also, they're also leucine sparing. And this also would reduce the propensity to break down muscle for amino acids. Yep, that's right. Yep, well said. That's another aspect.
Well, Ben, I hope the key takeaway people get from this interview is that they should view food through the lens of insulin resistance. And perhaps not only that, but that is one useful way to think about food. As you say, what will this food do to my insulin isn't a question that people generally ask. If they ask anything like that at all, it usually is about glucose. Overwhelmingly, they ask themselves, will this food make me fat? Will it make me heavier? And as I said, sometimes will it elevate my glucose? We could make a serious dent in our obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemic if people would think more seriously about insulin and if more physicians would test for it. I, I look at a lot of my friends and colleagues' blood tests and they rarely have insulin on them. That's right. So Ben, what new and exciting research do you and your lab colleagues have in mind, not now, but on the near-term horizon? Like, what, what, what are you thinking about looking at soon? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I'll just mention some studies in their primordial state at the moment. I'd noted one with regards to ketones in the hippocampus, so everyone look for that work to come out soon. It is very interesting, noting changes in energy use in the brain in animals when ketones are higher, and not only the changes in the brain energy use, but also changes in behavior and movement and curiosity. So these, these very real, tangible alterations in behavior and cognition. So that'll be published soon, but more in their primordial state. I guess I'd mention just two studies because they're a little... Weird, which makes them kind of fun. It's the beauty of science. When you get paid to be curious, it doesn't pay very well, but it sure is a fun job. One of them is to, I was at a meeting recently with a guy named um, Rick Johnson. And if anyone recognizes his name, it's because he is leading the charge on uric acid. And he wrote a very cleverly titled book, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. But his whole work is looking at how fructose metabolism increases uric acid. And we were at this meeting and he kept saying insistently how uric acid caused insulin resistance. And I would say, well, it's not one of the primary causes, you know, Rick. And anyway, we got along wonderfully, actually, but it made me very curious and indeed has resulted in a collaboration that we're just starting to do. Basically, uric acid levels do cause insulin resistance when they're elevated, but it appears to do so by activating inflammatory pathways. And so the study is... Um, and maybe an additional context to this, it's not uncommon that when someone adopts a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet, that uric acid levels may go up, um, and yet they don't appear to suffer any consequences of that increased uric acid if it does go up. And it, it is not an uncommon observation. There are human studies to show that, but there appears to be no problem from it. And so the question that we're asking now is, are ketones able to inhibit the inflammation the immune pathway that uric acid is seeking to activate because they are, in fact, they appear to be going at the same target where uric acid is wanting to turn on. Beta hydroxybutyrate appears to want to turn off. We just don't know how they to, how they actually work when they're pitted against one another. So that's one project that we're just starting in cell culture model uh, and cell culture experiments to just, again, test the degree to which beta hydroxybutyrate can inhibit the inflammation caused by uric acid. And then another study in its early stages, and this one started with animals and then will move to cells, is looking at the degree to which inhaled diesel particles, like from diesel fuel combustion, can accumulate in the fat cells and thereby aggravate mitochondrial processes to facilitate further weight gain. That's a very long-winded way of saying, if we breathe in diesel particles, is that making a person fatter? And so we have some very early studies of these animals exposed to diesel particles inhaled and the accumulation and activation of um, what could be detrimental pathways within the fat cells. Anyway, pretty compelling um, idea. Indeed. Yeah, that's really exciting. So Ben, we're going to shift a little bit and just ask you about your free time. So we understand that you end up in the gym when you have a, a bit of spare time. So what does your exercise regimen look like? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a funny question, just because it's few people would want to know how a scrawny freckled bald guy works out. You know, <laughs> that's not a, that's not a question I'm asked too often. Now, however, having joked a little at my own expense, I think I have been able to stay fit and do it pretty well. Mind you, it's a tremendous motivator. When you start to lose your hair in your mid twenties, you, you start to tell yourself I can be bald or I can be out of shape. I can't be both. And so <laughs> it, it's really been a motivating variable for me. 
It's purely a resistance, almost totally. I do very little aerobic, not because I don't like it. I just don't think it's as valuable minute for minute as it is to maintain more muscle mass. But I do enjoy an occasional run, but it is occasional. I split my workout such that of the five days a week, when I'm on campus and I go down to the gym here on campus, I will make sure that I do lower body on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and upper body on Tuesday and Thursday. I just want to make sure that my upper body never gets more attention than lower body because that's the temptation, right? There's something so much more ego boosting and gratifying to seeing your upper body swollen and and pumped, if you will, rather than your lower body where it just means you can't move around as easily as you could before. But for my lower body, it's weight based. I, I do, I lift weights, even if it's some quirky weightlifting and unique movements, it's still weightlifting in a classic sense with squats and deadlifts, mostly that kind of movement. Mm-hmm. Um, but then upper body is purely body weight based. I don't lift weights uh, for my upper body. I only do variations on pull-ups, variations on push-ups, you know, thinking of just push and pull movements. I never mm-hmm. do isolation exercises like working biceps or triceps. Those are kind of purely ego My view is what good is it having big biceps if you don't have lats or traps that can account for the closing arm, you know? So I like to look at the movement as a natural complex movement of a push or a pull. And so it's a lot of pull-ups, push-ups, and and various types of handstands. That was something when I turned 40 five years ago, I had a goal. I had always wanted to do a handstand push-up you know, where you just put your hands down and kick up Mm -hmm. into a freestanding handstand and then bring your nose down to the ground and push yourself back up. Mm -hmm. And it took about four years, uh, but now I can do them about half the time. Half the time I still fall over, but it required a very different way of working out. And that was when I stopped lifting weights on my upper body. I only started doing body weight based and it has been very, very fun to engage, you know, rings in in my type of pull-ups and doing various types of muscle ups or levers or whatever, but it's just a lot of hanging or pushing off mm-hmm. the ground. That's more yeah. like how wrestlers exercise. Handstand push-ups are a standard thing uh, for wrestlers, and I'm glad you're doing resistance training. I was on a podcast lately, and uh, I think I disappointed the host. He's you know some really <laughs> into like marathons or something, and. He said, well, you know, uh, how do you like to run? And I said, I run when someone is chasing me. (laughs) Yeah, well, and you can defend that position. You know, men who run more appear to die more remarkably. And their knees hurt. (laughs) Yeah, and they they just look scrawny, which for me in my already scrawny frame, I didn't need any more of that. (laughs) So, Ben, as we discussed at the beginning, your mother insisted that you learn how to play piano and at least one other musical instrument. So we want to know, do you still play music? I do. Uh, even this morning, I have my new challenge is learning how to play the Star Spangled Banner on the piano. Yeah, I love I love playing piano. I don't play trumpet. It's just so loud and it wakes everybody up. Um, but but even in addition to other instruments I'd learned over time, the piano is the one I always come back to. In part, admittedly, it's a bit practical. I, like I alluded to at the very beginning of this conversation, I, I have a very strong religious conviction and I enjoy playing hymns at church, actually. And so that's mostly what I play nowadays are hymns. But over this patriotic season, I love the United States so much, and I'm so proud to be a citizen. And and maybe part of that is because of, uh, absolutely, it's because of my upbringing, but also having been raised in another country. I'd like to think I can look at the United States with a bit of an objective view and see it for the incredible place that it is. And so during this kind of patriotic season, in addition to putting up a lot of stars and stripes bunting on the home and making sure the flag is brightly furled, um, I wanted to learn more patriotic songs. And I've, I've learned a few of them now, but the Star Spangled Banner, I don't think many people appreciate just how challenging that song is. There are a lot of key changes. Things are going flat and then they're going sharp. So it's a wonderful challenge. But what keeps coming, bringing me back to it, in addition to my affection for the country that it represents, is the harmony. That there will be a moment of dissonance. And then in the very next chord, you've resolved that dissonance into a beautiful harmony. It is, at its core, a beautiful anthem, and and I would even say hymn. Um, And there are beautiful anthems uh, around the world that I've always admired, but the the Star Spangled Banner, as as difficult as it is to sing, and it is a brutal song to have to sing because of the swing and and the key Uh, in the notes. Very hard. Yeah, it's very challenging, especially for a bass, Ken. Um, But... Nevertheless, the the actual construction of the music and the dissonance resolving in harmony frequently, I really have found it quite beautiful. So this morning I was playing it very loudly when I was needing to wake up my kids to go to swim lessons. That's a great way to wake up. (laughs) That sounds neat. 
Well, Ben, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much again for joining us on SEMTALK. It was my pleasure. Thank you guys so much. Absolutely. It, it was great fun. Thank you, Ben. STEM talk. 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 So I have to say that Ben is right when he says that most physicians tend to focus only on glucose when we ought to be paying more attention to insulin as well. And really, most physicians don't routinely test people for their insulin levels. And as Ben said, that's probably something that definitely needs to change. Absolutely. Insulin resistance is causing lots of havoc, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. And it's not just heart disease and diabetes we see as a partial consequence of elevated insulin, but also hypertension, fatty liver disease, dementia, low testosterone, and a host of other disorders. People would be indeed wise to get their insulin levels tested. Absolutely. If you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.